that strike a note to Mendelssohn wrote concerning spring weather. She admitted she wasn't much of an actress, but she later told author Franklin Moshier, I always thought I might have made it, but they could only see me as a voice. If they had given me some quick training, I might have made it. The musicals, in addition to some 30 shorts, paid Ruth up to $15,000 per appearance, often for less than a day's work. Even so, she avoided the spendthrift movie star lifestyle, partly because of her grandfather's advice of years before, and partly because of Moe's rough manners and crude treatment of others. It was easier not to mingle with picture people, she said. So I either saw non-professionals or New Yorkers who knew how to take Mo. But even a veteran New Yorker like Flo Zigfield refused to put up with Mo, who accused Zigfield of giving Ruth's rival, Helen Morgan, preferential treatment during the 1931 Follies. You ain't gonna shove the little lady round. He threateningly told Zigfield, who promptly had him banned from the theater. With a breeze, now the wind to them the In 1935, Ruth shocked everyone by announcing her retirement from show business. I'd been planning it for 15 years, she told New York's World Telegram in April of that year, complaining that radio was nervous work, that the glamour had gone out of the legitimate stage with the death of Flo Zigfield, and that her film work always ended up on the cutting room floor. She looked forward to retiring in the home she had bought in Beverly Hills, she said, where she could learn to swim in her new pool and do so many things I haven't been able to do since I was a kid in Nebraska. Variety claimed that Ruth was one of the wealthiest stars in the country, investing her money wisely during the 1920s, cashing out of the market before the crash in 1929, and using the proceeds of some $400,000 to buy land in California and in her home state. Though Ruth never did officially retire that year, close friends took it as a sign that she was under a great deal of stress and worried about her acceptance of a role in London musical Transatlantic Rhythm, which opened in the West End in 1936. Shortly after, Mo happened upon Ruth and the production's costume designer in the middle of an argument over one of her outfits for the show. Although Ruth later claimed it was strictly professional dispute, Mo took it as another attack on her and beat the costume designer severely enough to require hospitalization. When another argument broke out with the show's producer over delayed salaries, Ruth left the show and came home. In November of 1937, she was granted an uncontested divorce from Mo Snyder, claiming the last straw had been in London when she said he beat her legs with a cane. Mo later claimed he didn't contest the divorce because he always thought Ruth would come back to him. But no doubt the large sum of money that Ruth settled on him helped ease the separation. His cronies were only too glad to relieve him of the cash when he embarked on a round of heavy gambling in New York, where he claimed that when the money ran out, he'd head for the Hudson River and, quote, keep on walking until my hat floats. Once the divorce became public, Ruth destroyed all of her sheet music, her press clippings, her wardrobe, gave up her reported $200,000 a year she had been earning, 
and finally did retire from show business once and for all. moving permanently into her Beverly Hills home with Moe's daughter, Edith Snyder, from his first marriage. Edith, too, had grown tired of her father's bullying and gladly accepted Ruth's offer to take her on as a secretary. But both women would see Moe Snyder once more with disastrous consequences. About three years before the divorce, Mo had hired a new accompanist for Ruth, a genial pianist named Merle Alderman. Though Ruth would later claim that she and Merle never became lovers until after her divorce from Mo, the two were married in December of 1938, barely a month after the divorce became final. When a gossip columnist leaked the rumor to Mo, he swore he'd find out the truth. His method was to abduct Merle at gunpoint from a Beverly Hills parking lot, force him to drive home, and confront a terrified Ruth and Edith, demanding to know if it was true that Ruth and Alderman had been married. At this point, there was conflicted accounts given to the police of what exactly happened. But what I can tell you, as Ruth ran for her own gun, Mo aimed his gun at Ruth and his daughter Edie. Ruth begged Mo not to shoot Edie. But Mo fired upon Merle and shot him in the stomach. And he was bleeding so profusely that when he fell to the floor, both Ruth and Edie were convinced he was dead. Edie did grab the gun. I can also tell you that Edie fired at her own father, but they covered up the truth to save young Edie's persecution. I know this for a fact. But the accounts were given to the police, and Ruth even said so, I would gladly have killed Mo Snyder if I could have held the gun steady enough. She told the reporters outside the Los Angeles courtroom when Mo went on trial, and I could kill him now if I had a gun. It wasn't Ruth that was holding the gun. It was Edie, and they all agreed to cover it up to save her. While he was waiting for his trial to begin, Moe told young Hollywood columnist Ed Sullivan that he was lost without Ruth. Quote, when my money runs out, I'll hit myself in the topper with a couple of slugs and call it a day, he said, and claimed that without him, Ruth's career would have fizzled long ago. Found guilty of kidnapping, attempted murder, and violating California gun laws, Mo was sentenced to up to 20 years in prison. His lawyer managed to land a new trial on a technicality, but by then neither Ruth nor Edie would testify against him. Love is a funny thing to define, Ruth told the court at the first trial. And in the end, Mo served only a year of his sentence. He and Ruth never saw each other again. <laughs>